But I believe that by overwhelming majority in all the Americas, you and I in the long run, and if it be necessary, you and I will act together to protect, to defend by every means of our command. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast, where we discuss leaders, their decisions, and how they shape the world we live in today. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the History in Motion podcast. And today we're talking about someone who's gone throughout history for knowing, you know, one famous quote about her, and that's, let them eat cake. And that's the infamous Marie Antoinette, the wife of King Louis the Sixteenth, um, who her and her husband were embroiled in everything to do with the French Revolution. And, you know, spoiler alert, it, it, it didn't end well for for either of them. But I think um, as we've kind of gone through our research here, we've we started to look at Marie and Louis as, you know, these leaders who, you know, failed to adapt and really had the ultimate decision of sticking to their old ways, living a lavish life and not really caring for their subjects and ultimately causing costing them their life in the end. Um, but I think before we kind of get into Marie and everything about her life, there's a lot going on in this time period around Europe, um, specifically within France. So I think, Richie, maybe that's a good starting point for us to give the listeners a little bit of an overview on what Europe is seeing at this time and how things are changing from maybe the last time we we visited France with Joan of Arc and that more kind of medieval period moving to a you know Renaissance and, and post-Renaissance sort of world. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's good to kind of get a broad understanding of what's going on contextually here because it is a very, um, you know, dynamic period in history. I think there's a lot of competing factors, a lot of social and political upheaval that we often, you know, associate with this particular point in history. And I think given that it it is, you know, very complicated sometimes when you're trying to do some historical analysis. So, you know, I've tried my best to to paint a high enough, uh, I guess, a high overview that I think is, you know, reasonably digestible and kind of paints a picture without getting too lost in details because it is very easy to do that in this particular uh, period of history. So, you know, what we're really looking at in terms of timelines is the 18th century of France. Um, Again, it is something that is characterized by significant social and political changes. It's a time of, you know, increasingly political instability, social unrest. There's this, you know, intellectual ferment that eventually leads to the French Revolution 1789. So at the beginning of the 18th century, France was an absolute monarchy ruled by Louis XIV. Um, he's often known as the Sun King. So he adopted the image of the sun as his personal emblem and used it as a symbol of his power and grandeur. Uh, the I guess the idea behind this was to convey that just as the sun is the center of the solar system, and provides light and warmth to everything around it. Louis XIV was the center of France and provided guidance and protection to his people. Always find that very interesting. (laughs) I find the ego of monarchs, you know, just just really hard to wrap my head around sometimes. <laughs> you, you like to think it's almost like a marketing ploy to kind of get everybody on board to be like, all right, we got to follow this guy. But there's definitely some levels of deep seated narcissism that I think that's coming through the fray here. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like the self-anointed sun king. Like, wow. Okay. Awesome. What a, yeah. what a, what a handle to, to be walking around with, right? <laughs> self-anointed too. It's not like anyone named him that it was, you know, I, it's like, good morning, everyone. I am now the Sun King. And everyone has to just be like, all right, well, I guess he's the Sun King now. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> uh, but, you know, during his reign, uh, he had centralized, you know, power in his hands. His reign was marked by, and again, this I don't think this is unique to Louis XIV, uh, marked by extravagance, expansionism, and the construction of monumental buildings such as the Palace of Versailles. Um But in the same vein, his reign also witnessed the growth of discontent amongst his people, particularly the nobility, who resented his absolute power and sought greater political participation. Um, So I think it's probably worthwhile to touch briefly on this idea of what what is an absolute monarchy. I know this word kind of gets tossed around a lot with this particular period of history across Europe. Um, But at the beginning of the 18th century, France was an absolute monarchy ruled by Louis XIV, who kind of had absolute power right that's 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 kind of the central theme of, of absolute 
of an absolute monarchy. Um, however, by the end of the century, the French Revolution had kind of overthrown the monarchy and, and established a republic. But, you know, the absolute monarchy is a form of government which essentially, you know, centralizes power within the monarch and they have complete and total control over state power and its citizens. Uh, they essentially have unlimited authority and it's not bound by any real constitutions or laws. So they are able to exercise authority over all aspects of government. This includes the executive, legislative and judicial branches that we often think about when it comes to forms of government. They make all the decisions, they enforce all the laws. Um, they often have, you know, the assistance of councils, of, of advisors that, you know, they picked. They also are able to enforce and create laws to collect taxes, command the military. So really, you know, full stop power rests with them and they have the ability to kind of make decisions, um, you know, based on whatever is best for them and, you know, their counterparts to keep you know the, the monarchy and their advisors or the nobility happy. And it's pretty common across Europe at this time, right? Um, you have uh, Louis XIV of France, Peter the Great of Russia, you know, they have complete control over their realms. But over time, as we'll see, um, countries begin to move towards a constitutional monarchy in which the monarch's power is now limited by a constitution or some other legal framework. So over time, you can see that, you know, this idea of absolute monarchy begins to kind of diminish um, with more representation happening, you know, on a more quote unquote equal way <laughs> across the different like social stratifications. And I think it's interesting too, just going back to, we talked about kind of the Roman empire the last couple of weeks. Um, and one of the interesting things there is, you know, you have these emperors, but you know, they still had to keep, we talked about like keeping the Senate and the people and the army happy in this type of, you know, 1700 years later, it is a bit different in the sense of like that ultimate power between the emperor and the, and the king exists, but almost what like in Europe is like almost this divine power that these leaders seem to give They're you know, they're not generals leading on the front lines anymore. And it's almost like a way to almost keep their reign even more secure. So you can even see this level of, if you have someone who's a little bit kind of out of it, as we'll see a little bit later in terms of like the goings on of their empire or their kingdom, they don't really have this worry too much about like, oh, I got to keep the army happy because they might turn around and try to overthrow me because you have this like deep seated family and noble kind of lineage that's there. And it's people are loyal to this family more so than maybe just the name or the person who's there and aren't you know looking for ways to to stab them in the back when they get a chance it does happen but i think we can just see that there's a big kind of contrast there and i think this is almost why it's a little bit more deep-seated when we really really say it's absolute monarchy in terms of what laws and everything are passed but also on like just the level of like risk when it comes to transitions of power and things like that at least at this point in time um in europe yeah <clears throat> I think that's a really good point. So I didn't really mention it here, but it is a theme that's kind of central to this idea of absolute monarchy, which is the divine right of kings. Going really back in the archives in my brain right now uh, <laughs> to a university course that I took on this, but essentially it is, you know, the divine right of kings, the sense of divinity and how the monarch is essentially, you know, the representation of, of, of godly powers on earth, right? Like they are anointed, they are chosen, they are ruling their kingdom very much with the uh, chosenness of, you know, whatever religion or God that is kind of reinforcing their power. So you do have this kind of coupling of divinity and monarchy, which I think obviously reinforces um, their power and absolute control of things. But, right. you know, as we'll see, that, um, <laughs> that doesn't last much longer in this particular point in time. Um, I think just a, maybe just a quick nuance here um, that, that, that the listeners should be aware of. So, you know, we talk about absolute monarchy, we talk about absolute control, absolute power, but, you know, to a certain degree, you know, <laughs> this is a bit of a, a false narrative in a way, right? Because you can't truly be an absolute dictator without, you know, making or, you know, marginalizing or isolating some of those more powerful parties that might be within your realm. So we're talking about nobility, um, powerful merchants, you know, the clergy, so yeah, there, there is still some sort of structure in government here. Um, there's various administrative units such as provinces and parliaments with varying degrees of autonomy and influence. Uh, they are, however, appointed by the king. You know, there's <laughs> ministers and judges, and these appointments are often influenced by powerful aristocrats and other interest groups. You know, so there is a lot of nepotism, but there is this bit of, you know, as much as there is a centralization of power, there is also a degree of, of this decentralization of power, um, you know, largely that doesn't necessarily, you know, 
uh, create an equal playing field for everybody, but um, there is some control that's kind of outsourced to other, you know, nobility or clergy to kind of keep um, that that monarchy intact and have a at least have enough um, strength to 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 actually govern. Right. So that's kind of like they're each kind of region is is governing. I wouldn't say independently, but like kind of dealing with the day to day things that don't need to go up to the king, but ultimately they know how they got to that position and they know who they're loyal to. So when it comes exactly. time for that, you know, we need troops or we need a new law that the king is pushing down, they're going to do it most of the time, no questions asked. Exactly, right? Like you, you can't isolate and marginalize everyone um, <laughs> because that is inevitably going to backfire. Um, so I think there is a bit of give and take here and it's a bit of a balancing act. Um, so we can kind of fast forward a little bit. So, you know, we, so the death of Louis the Fifteenth. Uh, sorry, Louis the Fourteenth in 1715 marks this new era in French history. Um, his successor, Louis the Fifteenth, is often kind of criticized for being a very indecisive monarch who was influenced by his advisors. This period is, you know, frequently marked by wars, economic problems, and social unrest, um, and the government's inability to kind of address these issues, which leads to a growing sense of frustration amongst the people, particularly the growing middle class who demand greater political participation and representation. Um, and we can kind of pivot to the Enlightenment here a little bit to talk about some of the ideas that are that are growing, that are really, you know, manifest into something that, you know, will ultimately change the landscape of France, but, you know, more or less the Western world eventually. So it's this intellectual and cultural, you know, movement that emerges in France in the mid-18th century. It's characterized by a commitment to reason, scientific progress, and human rights. Uh, some of its leading thinkers include Voltaire, Rousseau, Montesquieu, who challenged traditional beliefs and championed individual freedoms, social equality, religious tolerance, as well as new ideas about human nature, political organization, the role of government, which inevitably influenced the development of democratic and liberal thought throughout the world. It was a time where people began to question traditional authority and religious beliefs and instead turned to empirical evidence and reason as the basis for knowledge and understanding. And obviously these ideas had a profound impact on French society and continue, conti contributed to the growing demand for political and social change. So a lot of those, you know, sentiments I just shared, right? This idea of questioning traditional authority, religious beliefs, the role of government, this is like in direct opposition to what's been going on for the last couple of centuries, right? For since time in memoriam for you know this kind of monarchical rule so you can only imagine how revolutionary these thoughts are yeah it's a little like we've got like if you look up to like the last two thousand years like it is this just one supreme leader sort of setup and it is it, you're right it's it's these are two ideologies that are just going to start clashing right away it's just it's such a kind of mix between the two and i think where we see in countries like britain who kind of transition to this constitutional monarchy where it's you have these royalists who are kind of they want to keep the monarchy but then you have the people fighting for some sort of change to the system and you kind of find that happy medium between like you know the king is still in charge but here are the here's the constitution here's all these things that they need to keep in mind um so yeah it's it's not surprising where things lead to in france and to some other countries you know, even the United States, for example, when it comes to there's a lot of blood that comes out of this because these ideologies are like mm -hmm. so firmly entrenched. It's like you're going to change the last 2000 years of history and then potentially like people who have had unchecked power and unchecked wealth for years and, you know, centuries are really at risk of losing it and are going to do everything in their power to not lose it. And then the people who have very little and now see an opportunity to, to gain something and, you know, push forward this ideology in their eyes that is going to be better than what what current things are yeah it's a it kind of is a bit of a recipe for disaster but it can also work out and, and create some of you know the great nations we see today and but you know it's, it didn't get there without a little bit of blood and um you know some different some civil unrest turmoil whatever you want to call it yeah totally agree and i think these are some of the key implications that you know are like us and our listeners should be aware of when we talk about the enlightenment because you know it's not the easiest thing to unpack right the enlightenment as a movement you know we could spend hours talking about it just just the enlightenment alone in a, in a silo but i think some of the key implications you just touched on paul you know this increased emphasis on reason and rationality uh to promote the use of critical thinking to challenge traditional beliefs and practices 
for a greater emphasis on science, reason, and rationality. Challenges to traditional authority, which I think you just, you know, really just nailed. This is a huge one. Uh, to challenge those traditional sources of authority, the monarchy, the Catholic Church. Um, Enlightenment thinkers really wanted to promote the idea of individual liberty and the separation of church and state, which led to a growing sense of independence and autonomy amongst the French people, which is huge. That is in direct contrast to how the society be society has been functioning for centuries. Oh, and then, you know, last but not least, you know, this idea of greater social mobility to help promote, uh, you know, greater equality across the population and that people should be judged on their abilities and accomplishments rather than their social status. So this led to a growing middle class in France and people were able to rise through the ranks based on merit rather than birthright. Again, like a, like a, a bit of a, you know, a departure from what we've seen historically in many ways. And ultimately, mm-hmm. you know, leads to massive political upheaval. And when you kind of say it, it's like, oh, people come up on on merit, not on birthright. And, you know, in the modern day, we're like, well, of course, it yeah, makes sense. Why makes would it sense. be any other way? But that was a very novel concept back then. Like this was birthright was everything, you know, the name that you associated yourself with or the family you were born into was pretty much everything. And we even talked about it when we were talking about Joan of Arc and it's kind of her upbringing was she wasn't part of the nobility, wasn't part of the clergy. So the fact that she even got to where she was, let alone being a woman it's at incredible. that time, is the the odds were almost zero, right? And even if she was someone with, what she was obviously was someone with great merit, to even to get to that point was almost impossible. And I think a lot of these thinkers are starting to see like there's a lot of great people within the world and within their within France that deserve an opportunity to make France better. But then there's also the flip side of we have a bunch of useless people who are, you know, have the name, but don't really have the skills to lead, which again, is foreshadowing a little bit to the latter part of this episode. But it really is just like a very modern way of thinking. And, you know, and you can probably point to it as the reason why you know, Western Europe and a lot of these countries that are following, you know, this sort of ideology exploded in power and, you know, sci- scientific revolution and all these kind of things over the last 200 years. I think a lot of ways you can point back to not just this specifically, but it's definitely a huge piece to, to everything that's changing. But I think uh, your last point, you know, the, this kind of division between merit and birthright. And sometimes it's easy to pick on the nobility and the monarchy, you know, because they are targets, especially, you know, when we're doing historical analysis to say, you know, look how useless they were or look how ineffective they were as leaders. And I think, um, you know, in our last episode, when we talked about Commodus, sometimes you just inherit a bad situation, right? Like you just inherit a, like, a, like a country, a regime or, you know, whatever it may be that is just just troubled with a variety of compounding issues. And I think um, with Louis XV, it's, it's, this is definitely a, a part of that case. You know, if we look quickly at some of the economic problems that France is facing uh, during his reign. So we have several economic problems during the 18th century, which contributed to, you know, the financial crisis, which again is like a compounding factor with this social upheaval and political upheaval that's going on that helped uh, nev- essentially spark the French Revolution. You have high levels of government debt. You know, France had accumulated significant debt as a result of many costly wars, uh, which were compounded by extravagant spending in the previous century. The government was forced to borrow heavily to finance its operations, leading to a mounting debt crisis. They had an outdated and inefficient tax system. Uh, the tax system was, you know, increasingly outdated and extremely inefficient, and it, you know, seemingly failed to generate sufficient revenue to cover government expenses. Uh, most of the nobility and clergy were exempt from taxes, <laughs> placing a heavy burden on the peasantry and the lower classes, which I think is is a really a telltale sign of what is to follow. You have economic stagnation. France's economy had stagnated during the 18th century with little growth or innovation. Again, this was partly due to government regulations and restrictions that stifled, you know, entrepreneurship and economic activity in in the region at the time. You have inflation and food shortages. You know, in the later part of the 18th century, France experienced a series of food shortages and, and price increases, which led to widespread poverty and social unrest. Again, these are exacerbated by inflation, which reduced the value of the currency and made it harder for people to afford basic necessities. And when we say people here, we're really talking about, you know, the majority of people, which is the peasantry and the rural working class who are the most heavily taxed and are the most likely to actually be impacted by rising inflation. So you have all these economic problems, which were major factors that would, you know, influence and contribute to the French Revolution. And as people across the country became increasingly frustrated, rightfully so, you know, this doesn't sound like a great place to be if you're not 
a part of the upper echelons of French society, you're going to start looking at the government's inability to address these issues and help, you know, your part of the population. So, you know, ultimately, these French revolutionaries sought to create new, more equitable economic systems that would provide greater opportunities and prosperities to all French citizens. And I think quickly, Paul, before we kind of get into the bio side of things, I could probably quickly touch on this, the social structure. Mm -hmm. I think we've mentioned it a couple of times in this podcast before, but I think you're probably already getting a sense that this is a highly stratified um, social, uh, you know, social system divided into three classes. You, you know, you have the three estates, which is typically how we kind of uh, discuss uh, the social classes within France at the time. You have the clergy, the nobility, and the commoners. The clergy made up less than 1% of the population, enjoyed significant privileges, held substantial wealth and power. The nobility made up around 2% of the population, also enjoyed substantial wealth and power, and held many key positions in government and military. And then lastly, we have the commoners who made up the majority of the population and were divided into this, I guess, urban and rural workers, merchants and professionals, and they had extremely limited political rights and were subject to the highest taxes and social restrictions. So I think, you know, in a nutshell, we have a highly stratified French society with an extremely privileged nobility and clergy, a growing middle class, a large population of poor peasants who are increasingly frustrated by the ineffectiveness of their government. You know, you have this sense of growing discontent that seemingly will bubble over into what we ultimately know now as the French Revolution. And I think it's interesting, just as you were talking there about, you know, people growing up, you know, getting opportunity based on merit versus name, right? And we have, you know, you couldn't get to the level of nobility based on merit, but within that peasant class, there's definitely a level of merit that's starting to rise up. And I think if, you know, some of your smartest, most productive people are getting to that cap of what they can get to based on their social class, these are very smart and successful people who are doing very well for themselves within the constraints that they have. And as you were saying, that growing middle class of more people starting businesses and learning how to really take care of their families in ways that, you know, maybe didn't involve just working on a farm or something like that, like being a merchant or learning a trade, you're going to get a lot more of these people who are starting to realize like how rigged the system actually is. And I, I think kind of, as you were talking, I'm like, you can see why this was a powder keg re ready to explode is all these people are starting to move up within their level of social hierarchy. But then they get to that cap and it's like, well, hold on. Wh why can't I go any farther than this? And how much am I paying in tax? How much are they paying in tax? And so, yeah, I think it's it's pretty straightforward where anybody would be frustrated in that time period. And I think it, just to just to go on that a little bit, I think it really speaks to, you know, this kind of spark that the Enlightenment represents and this kind of broader questioning that is likely going on amongst the peasantry and the common folk. Right. This this uh, this more uh, critical, rational approach to thinking and questioning about traditional norms you know you start asking yourself what's going on here <laughs> yeah <laughs> and eventually you might not like the answers that you you know you reasonably come to so maybe just a just a quick note on kind of these these social stratifications a little bit more before we jump into kind of the bio of, of marie antoinette so again often the three estates i think we kind of glaze over pretty quickly you have like the clergy the, nob the nobility the clergy and then the common folk but there is some you know a a, a few more divisions in that you have the nobility at the top who are like you know the peak of the social hierarchy who held all the majority of the wealth and privilege the clergy the catholic church is pretty much you know unchecked in its power you know the church and state are uniquely coupled at this time you have the bourgeoisie so this is a word that is often used when we're talking about this particular historical period you know they're right below the nobility and clergy uh, they're merchants, bankers, professional. They're a growing class during the 18th century, and they held, you know, increasingly more wealth and influence. And you have the peasantry. Um, during the 18th century, they were peasants who lived in rural areas, worked the land, farmers, little social mobility, and often lived in poverty and squalor. You have the urban working class. So you have this kind of urbanization that's going on at the time, uh, in addition to the peasantry. So this, er this, this class of urban workers during France in the 18th century, they included artisans, laborers, servants who worked in cities and towns and often lived in cramped and unsanitary conditions. So again, like it is a period of massive social inequality and conflict in French society. And again, it's one of those, it's one of, of, of a handful of key contributing factors that led to the French Revolution, you know, the terror, um, 
the executions, you know, the blood and violence that we often connotate with this particular period in history. And I hope we've done a good job of kind of, you know, painting the landscape as to, you know, I, I never want to say that things are inevitable in history, but, you know, because it's a kind of a slippery slope, but you can begin to understand how these factors all individually started galvanizing together and compounding into what would, you know, lead to this massive result, revolt, sorry, and upheaval and overthrow of the monarchy. I think this might be a good kind of uh, pivot point to talk a little bit more about our central figure today, who's uh, Marie Antoinette. Yeah, I think just as you kind of end off there, like, I think inevitable, it's you don't want to say it, but I think it, it is true in this case. And especially with the fact that like, so many things would need to change in order for this not to happen or like a catastrophic event, like a plague or a really major war or, you know, the very identity of France is at risk, but it didn't happen. So I think we can say it was inevitable and we'll call it a day. Um, but yeah, let's jump into Marie Antoinette a little bit. And before we kind of get into her, we have to kind of look at her mother, who is a very, very interesting woman in her own regard. So her mother was Maria Theresa, who was the Austrian empress at the time. So she had 15 children while running a country. So talk about, uh, talk about being busy i would say um i don't know how anybody has that much time to not let alone run an empire but raise and and have 15 different kids which i think is pretty incredible and there's a quote here that i liked um it says she regarded her eight daughters as pawns on the european chessboard to be married off to seal alliances <laughs> she barely paused in her paperwork to give birth on november 2nd 1755 to her 15th child which was marie antoinette so Maria Theresa ran the Austrian Empire for, or again, within the Holy Roman Empire. And there's, again, a lot of nuances to that, which would take almost a whole podcast to explain. But she ruled for about 40 years and, and goes down as one of the great leaders in European history. She's known for modernizing the military, the legal system, really seen as a strong-willed leader, deeply committed to her job, but also a very loving mother when it came to her children, but also to her subjects as well. So she definitely found that nice balance between being loved by the people and showing love and respect to them, but also being like a little bit more hard-headed, strong when it, when it came time to, you know, getting down to brass tacks and, and getting things done. So really the model of what you would want um, in, a, in a leader at this time, which kind of we don't really see coming to Marie Antoinette. So there's some discussion about her as a child or um, she's been a basically Maria Theresa um, makes an agreement with the King of France at the time to marry Marie to the future Louis the 16th to basically cement that relationship between the two families and really bring some peace between the two countries who have been on at war on and off for many, many years. So, um, Louis sends a tutor to to Austria to start getting Marie kind of up to speed on on French life, the French language, and stuff like that. He realizes very quickly that she's she can barely read or write her own native German, let alone French, which she's going to have to know. Um, but he does say that her heart, her character, are all excellent. Um, she he found that she was much more intelligent than generally she was. You know, he thought she was supposed to be, but it apparently was just incredibly lazy and just didn't want to work on any of these <laughs> things, which again, 13 year old kid living in a palace as a princess, but he could kind of see that deep down there was some intelligence and, you know, a good heart and everything, which I think is important for someone going into that role um, as essentially going to be not someone who should be making a lot of these dec big decisions. That should, that's Louis's job. She's there to really do two things. One have a male heir to keep the dynasty going, mm -hmm. um, but also to kind of support Louis and make sure he has everything he needs to to rule and, and be that loving mother, but also kind of bring that social element to the monarchy and, you know, be seen as someone who's loved by the people and, you know, just kind of that warmer, kind of more, almost more of a motherly nurturing kind of um, yep. second in command to Louis. But that all presides on Louis being a strong leader himself, which... From like the earliest time when um, Marie is sent to, to Austria, there's actually a, a sad story where they take her to the border between France and Austria and basically make her change from her German looking clothing into her French looking clothing. And apparently they take her dog away because it's an Austrian dog, which is just so sad. You can't take a little girl's dog away like that. But 
don't worry it it, it turns out well i think um i think it was like a couple of years after she was quite sad not having her dog and they yeah, said all right you can have the dog back to her right oh, yeah thank god yeah so the, yeah so the dog uh the dog survives and you know is able to live the rest of its life with marie which is quite nice to see um but her Apparently her wedding um, had an entourage that included 57 carriages, 117 foot soldiers, and 376 horses um, that showed up to... That's, that's, that's pretty low-key. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, uh, you know, it's something if you if you weren't looking closely, you might have missed it. So this is just a start of like the extravagance of what you kind of mentioned from the French monarchy. But with bringing Marie in, it's starting from day one is this extravagance and everything is over the top. Um so she meets Louis for the first time. Um, they're only, I think, like 14 and 15, respectively, at the time, so quite young. But Louis is apparently, he's this kind of guy, this kind of kid who's just really not interested, the kind of guy who's not interested in girls. He's not interested in being social. He's definitely kind of has this feeling of unworthiness, is how some historians kind of categorize him at the time. They say he has a, a deep interest in language and history and geography and science, really loves to be alone and kind of work on things themselves and just kind of keep himself isolated where Marie is the opposite. And we'll see how this kind of grows as their time goes on. But really, Louis never really showed much interest in her um, from a young age. Um, and while she was very open and social, it's just, again, a tough match for for the two of them. So they were married on May 16th, 1770, where Marie was only 14 and Louis was only 15. However, the marriage was not consummated at the time. It would not be consummated for another seven years. And within that time, Louis the 15th had died and Louis the 16th had become king of France. So again, I think we can give them some forgiveness on not consummating the marriage at 14 and 15 from maybe a more modern standpoint. You know, that's incredibly young, but that's not how the court of France is seeing this. They're seeing this as every day that they don't consummate the marriage. That's another day where something catastrophic could happen to Louis the 16th and then there's no male heir and then that leads to instability, power struggles, all that kind of thing. And we have to remember too, like this is not just the monarchy and the leaders, but these are the celebrities of the time, right? Like they want to see, they want something to talk about. They want to be able to say like, oh, did you hear that Marie gave birth or, you know, start to talk about the new prince or princess and, and those sort of things. And they, they want some gossip. They want some things to talk about because they lead. So they want to have that stability, but they also kind of want some of that pop culture in a, in a way that's very different than maybe we see today. But even if you look at the way the British royal family is treated today, I'd say it's very similar, but just they have this added level of power that, you know, we, we don't really see today. So the thing we say with Louis as well is that he may have had like a physical handicap that kind of made sex painful for him. Um, so he eventually had surgery to correct the problem. So there was a lot of this like, oh boy, nothing's going to happen here. Um, but Eventually, Maria, Maria Theresa starts encouraging her daughter to lavish more caresses on her husband. Gotta love 18th century uh, language there. But she dispatches her son to stir up kind of, I, I don't really know how he's helping them, but he's trying to make sure that, you know, they can be more affectionate with each other. And apparently whatever he did worked because they actually ended up writing letters to him in, in the future, thanking him for everything that he did and then eventually they they were able to um to have kids and i think they ended up having i think it was three or four kids but the male heir did exist and there was a, a louis the 17th waiting in the wings um at some point so they're able to kind of come through all of this and and have kids but again more as a necessity versus um you know then you know something that they just kind of came naturally to them um there's some stuff i have written here about just kind of the difference between um Marie and uh and Louis like Louis is the kind of guy where he's loves to tinker with gadgets and different things like that and read and you know by 11 p.m he's in bed lights are off he's up early in the morning versus Marie where it's like 11 p.m is just when her night is starting you know and then she would kind of sleep in late so you have this like very extroverted outgoing partier kind of person versus someone who's very introverted and, and likes to kind of just stick to themselves. So very, very different sort of sort of people. And there's a quote from Marie where she says, my tastes are not the same as the king's who's only interested in hunting and metalworking. So, you know, <laughs> very, very different people. But Marie is also feeling a bit of homesickness too in kind of her younger days. Um, she writes to her mother saying, I've not received one of your dear letters without having tears come to my eyes. So it's basically like this is a very, very 
different worlds for her. So you have to remember she's going to a place where French is now her second language, which hard enough as a kid to, to figure out. But she also has eyes on her all the time. She never has a private moment. She's being always around essentially an army of servants. There's other nobilities within the Palace of Versailles who are always kind of talking about her, looking at her, seeing her as the center of attention. And part of what we talked about is how she was outgoing and very social. That was also part of her job, right? She had to take all of these people that were around her and kind of you know, help build relationships and things like that. But then she also genuinely enjoyed it. Um, but that was the kind of the thing where it's like, you just imagine never having a private moment. You're and not even like when you return to, you know, you're done for the night, you still have servants sitting in the room and, you know, they're definitely talking to each other. And it's, it's a really, you've signed up for a life of being in the public eye and open to public scrutiny, essentially 24 seven. And then you're not really having a husband who's really interested in doing the same things you do and maybe could have some pull to give you some some private time like it's not something that really came easy for for either of them and i think it's something marie really struggled with you know early on in in her life so we do look at marie though and we talk about she is very outgoing very extravagant but the level of extravagance i think we really have to double down here with so i think you kind of talked about richie earlier on the extravagance of building the palace of versailles and so I, the important thing to know about versailles is versailles is not within the city of paris it's actually um i think we looked it up the other day it was like 20 miles or something like that outside of the city so this is very much a the nobility removing themselves from the common folk and living in the maybe the largest palace that maybe i've ever come across in in my life and the level of just wealth and riches and just over the top, I'm going to say over the topness. I know that's not a word, but I think it kind of works in this context for how grand of a palace and a place this is. And Marie kind of doubled down into that. So she, you know, would bought, you know, she, there's rumors she bought jewelry that would cost more than a mansion in Paris. She had her outrageous hairstyles they, that could rise up to three feet and would sometimes cr- contain an array of feathers. It was very over the top and ridiculous. But that was the trend at the time. People would look to Marie for inspiration and women in France were starting to do the same thing of like how large and extravagant you can make your hair was kind of a sign of wealth and power in a sense because you're trying to emulate, well, if the queen can get her hair to three feet and I can do the same, maybe I'm closer to Marie than you know my neighbor who can only get their hair to two and a half feet and doesn't have as nice of feathers and all those kind of things. So... Again, a little ridiculous. There's another story about she spent six equivalent of six million dollars today on this like set of like houses and like almost to get like a almost like a woodland sort of theme park sort of setup on Versailles for her and her friends to kind of have like social gatherings to. Um, she also had there's like a, a cottage kind of area that was in the back of Versailles, which Louis said she could have, and she built it into like a private getaway for her and her her friends, which again was part of Louis helping her get some of that private time. But think about being in court. Whoever got invited to this cottage was like, oh my God, that's amazing. I get to go hang out with the queen all day. But if you didn't get invited, the rumor mill starts to to move because it's a lot of jealousy mm-hmm. and like what's going on there? What is all these ladies doing in there? And you can put two and two together on you know, some of the nasty things people would say and, and, you know, that those stories start to move into the general public um, as Marie starts to be seen as more of a, a scapegoat for everything that's going on versus, um, you know, what's actually going on. And then on top of all of this, Maria Teresa fires off a letter to her, which says, you lead a, disp- a dispotated life. I hope I shall not live to see the, the, see the disaster that is likely to ensure. So we talked about Maria Teresa wow. being ridiculously wow. smart, a great leader. She sees the writing on the wall here, and thankfully for Maria Theresa, she dies of old age um, well before the whole craziness of the French Revolution really kicks in and, and doesn't have to see her her daughter get killed. But she's not she's not a silly person. She knows how this is going to end. You cannot keep spending and being so extravagant and when you know the way the world is going. So definitely I think the lesson is listen to your mother, especially if she's you know, a great ruler, <laughs> you know, our, they, they can see things coming before I think we can in our, in our younger years. So, you know, on top of all of that, we also just have one last thing with um, Louis not taking a mistress, which I think is a big thing to point out. So back in the mm-hmm. day, these Kings yeah. would take mistresses for whatever they want to do, but Louis didn't take one. And so a lot of these mistresses would kind of be like the focal point for a lot of gossip and attacks from, you know, tablo- the version of tabloids that existed at the time. But since Louis didn't have one, 
all that energy is getting funneled right into Marie. So she has this extravagant life, the general discourse of, I guess you could say, court life is kind of being pinned on her as well. Plus this lack of mistress all kind of funneled in and she slowly and actually, I wouldn't say even slowly, but very quickly becomes that center of attention for this entire court and eventually, you know, the French people. So a lot going on with Marie, extravagant, really pushing the limit and not really having a husband who's competent enough to to run the empire or the, the kingdom and really not enough to be a great husband and, and loyal person to her and, and be able to have a really a healthy marriage um, at all at this point. So when we move into Marie's relationship, we've already kind of talked about the French court a little bit. Um, I can even have some more notes here about how like she would buy 300 new gowns every year. Why not, right? You have the money and, you know, wanted to say things. But really things start to hit a tipping point when there was a failed grain harvest. Price of grain exploded. Civil unrest was at a tipping point, but closed off in their extreme luxury of Versailles, Marie and Louis, really oblivious to what was going on outside the walls. So again, this I think is pointed more at Louis from a, you have to know what's going on within your kingdom and then act upon it. And he was known for being incredibly <laughs> indecisive. And then this is a common, and this is just something we need to call out is... Um, when Marie Antoinette heard about this, she did not say, we'll let them eat cake. <laughs> I kind of looked into like where that came from. And so a French writer wrote that these words were said by, quote, a great princess. But the writing date precedes Marie Antoinette's arrival into France. I think it was like early 18th century. So it may have been even before she was born. Mm -hmm. And then some historians believe that he just made this thing up altogether because it sounded great from a literary perspective. But that, it, it does sound great. We still say it today. Exactly. It, it is quite the line. <laughs> it definitely stuck. And I think it it just worked from, you know, if you want to paint Marie in a bad light, point all the blame on her for all the, the terrible things that are going on in France at the time. It's a heck of a quote to to go to her. And, and again, it did stick. So definitely, um, definitely something that, you know, we didn't didn't really matter if it was true or not. It was all about like it just encompassed exactly. the general feeling at the time. Yeah, so a couple other things that kind of happened. Just to a her. quick point on yeah, that. Paul. Go for it. I think uh, to your to your uh, the point about let them eat bread or let them eat cake, whatever was potentially said. I've seen both, um, but I think we can confidently say that it wasn't said by her, even though it sounds great and people will continue to you know, attribute it to her wrongfully. I can see mm -hmm. why it is, uh, you know, attractive uh, to say because you know with the grain prices going up, you have bread riots taking place. And I think that's kind of the context that people often miss is like, oh, she said, let them eat, let them eat cake. This is during a time where people are rioting over bread because they can't afford it anymore. So, you know, if you kind of, you know, we'll pretend that, you know, even though she didn't say it, that the power of that statement and what it represents at that time where the majority of the population is rioting over bread prices because they can't eat or feed their families or themselves to have someone who buys 300 gowns a year, who has three foot long hair uh, <laughs> adorned with feathers and jewels to, to have the audacity to say, let them eat cake. You can only imagine how gut wrenching and how, how much anger could be spewing out from the commoners to, to, to hear that. Right. And I think, and I'm sure we'll get into it, but like the the symbol that she starts to become and the focal point of this kind of seething revolutionary energy and anger that she begins to represent moving forward. So I think there's there, we say that statement so often. I think Jay-Z even has a line about it in one of his <laughs> songs, but it, it, it just encapsulates so much. Right. And I think it really does paint a very powerful picture of what she begins to represent uh, within French society at the time. Yeah, I think this is a that's kind of a great segue into kind of where we're going to go with Marie next. And I think that's a great point. Like there's literally the streets are on fire and this quote is pouring gasoline on that fire and just making people more angry exactly. and more mad. Yep. But I get it, right? It's people are riding for bread. And she, like you were saying, she's sticking jewels in her hair and, and buying a new gown every day and spending millions of dollars on a, a, like a social hangout for her friends. Like it's just it's just such a black and white situation where on one hand you can't feed your children where this person can live the most luxurious life maybe ever there's a there's a tipping point and there's a balancing act that needs to happen which again the only person who really seems to realize that i'm sh at least from what i've saw in my research was 
with Maria Teresa. And I'm sure there's people within the French court that saw it as well. But again, Louis not seeing it. And he's the one who's really, as we talked about, he's the absolute monarch. He's the one calling the shots and, and doesn't really put a stop to to any of this in terms of the bread riots, but also um, the lavish spending. So top of all of this, um, Marie Antoinette was rumored to having an affair with a Swedish diplomat. Um, she actually proclaims to love him in some correspondence. Again, we don't know the full extent of what this is, but a lot of historians believe that they were in love and having some sort of relationship mm -hmm. um, who actually plays a key part um, when things kind of go down the downhill for the the monarchy. But then there was this thing um, which really kind of kickstarted Marie be kind of moving outside of just like this lavish spender to someone who really just hates France and hates the common people. So it was called the jewelry scandal. So she basically became victim to one of the greatest swindles um, in history. So the way it kind of works was this this lady who was kind of the, the title here that someone wrote was a fortune hunter, which I think is a, an apt term for them, persuaded a gullible cardinal that she was a close friend of the queen, um, even though the cardinal never heard of heard of her. Um, basically, she forged a letter um, saying that the queen wanted the cardinal to go buy a necklace of 647 diamonds costing 1.5 million francs, which is around $4.7 million today. Um, basically, the, in the writing, the queen, the queen, I'm doing air quotes, said she was too embarrassed to ask Louis for such an expensive present and was re relying on the cardinal to obtain it for her and that she would pay him back in full once um, she got the jewelry. The cardinal being very gullible went and did that, purchased the necklace, and then gave it to this to this lady who gave it to her husband who right away took it to London and broke it up and sold it off and made a ton of money. And then the queen essentially found out and was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> this, I'm sorry, Mr. Cardinal, this is uh, not something I, I ever authorized to do. So therefore, there was a, a trial that happened. But you know, as we talked about, think of French society now. Like these are the celebrities. Think of your favorite celebrity almost swindling a um, a local jeweler for a bunch of money. She was not on trial for this. The cardinal was, and you know, the people involved were were brought onto trial. But that's whatever happens there is kind of besides the point. The point here was everybody saw Marie as being on trial. They all assumed she was part of it, even though she had nothing to do with it. There was, you know, this public perception of her being greedy and someone who hated the common people was just now blown up on a national scale. And some even criticized Louis for even bringing this to trial and saying he should have just dealt with it privately because it just the fanfare that came from this was so large. And she was given the name Madame Deficit, <laughs> which I thought was quite funny. So, you know, and being known for her spending and, and all of this, this just kind of brought things to you know the forefront. That's great. That What a what a name. Yeah, he, so good. The French are always good for that kind of stuff. Is again, it's a simple name, but when it's just said by kind of with that French Frenchness to it, it kind of has a little bit more punch, which I kind of love. So all of this is Marie is seen as you know this lavish spender, someone who really hates the common people. But then we have to add on top of that is she's Austrian. At the end of the day, she's not one of them, and it's very you know the French love to blame her for not having France's best interests in 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 her heart, which ultimately. She does to an extent um, when it comes to like France ruled by a monarchy. She's definitely pro that France ruled by a republic. She's probably not the most loyal to that. Mm -hmm. So again, she, Austria, longtime enemy of France, as we kind of talked about, you know, when she's threatened by the mob, um, she actually writes letters in cipher and in invisible ink to other European countries asking them to help invade France and restore order. So the kind of revolutionaries at this point see this as you know, treason because they're asking a foreign country for help. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, a lot of the people who are pro monarchy are seeing like, well, this is just a way to gain, gain alliances and, and settle everything down. So this doesn't erupt into civil war. But again, the people don't see it that way. This is, you know, talking to the enemy and really kind of jump starting um, this revolution. And kind of the last point on her, I think, about kind of how she is, is Again, we talk about her lavishness, but again, she definitely did have a good heart. Um, she adopted a poor peasant boy who I think was almost run over by her carriage. Um, she was definitely known yep. for being philanthropic and, and really putting some work into helping the poor and things like that. But ultimately, that only goes so far when you're, you know, bread riots, putting jewels in your hair, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's definitely a push and pull. So this kind of gets us to, you know, the revolution in France kind of taking you know, front and stage. And I think just just to save our listeners some time here, I don't think we're going to get into the revolution 
too much, but I guess at the end of the day is all the things that you have talked about, Richie, and we've talked about of this powder keg has kind of exploded now. Um, there are riots in the streets. You know, the storming of the Bastille has happened, which was a famous, you know, historical event where the mob took over kind of like a military prison slash fortress. And that was yep. kind of this, the jump start of kind of the violence and the people having some power. So that kind of all is going on. And within that time, a mob essentially forces Louis to leave Versailles and come to Paris for a couple of reasons. One is you need to see what's going on here. But also number two is they kind of wanted to keep um, an eye on him. And this is where we kind of see where some historians look at Louis being indecisive when all of this was happening. He was kind of, oh, I don't know what we should do. Should we go? Should we stay? And where Marie was kind of more decisive saying we should get out. We need to we need to find a way to escape. Um, so that, that doesn't happen right away. They do get moved to yep. Paris. But then Marie kind of devises a plan to get her family out of Paris to a fortified town um, in the north of France. Um, however, she ignored the advice of just <laughs> making the trip very light, take two light carriages, be inconspicuous. She insisted on keeping the family together in a large lumbering coach called a Berlin, which was which had a silver dining service, a clothes press, and a small wine chest. So it's like, even for her, I'm sure that was a step down, but for most of us, of we're course. like, you know, a yeah. wine chest, really? Um, <laughs> But it doesn't really work out for them. 130 miles east of Paris, they were recognized by a group of villagers um, taken to a, a local municipal house. Um, then they were brought back to Paris where um, they were greeted, I'll say, in air quotes, by an angry mob of Parisians lining the streets who um, you know, were not too happy with them. So as kind of things are going on now, Louis is pressured by the assembly, which is this kind of group of nobility and, and people within um Kind of their first move in towards having some sort of, I guess you could call it a parliament for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. um, is pressured yep. into declaring war on Austria. But the mob starts to suspect that the king and queen are plotting with the enemy. So they storm the palace in Paris, killing over a thousand guards and noblemen, where the family is taken and locked in what was called Temple Tower, which is a military fortress and essentially um, imprisoned. And then this is where things get, I think, kind of sad and a little where you can kind of feel a lot of empathy from Marie Antoinette here, where they know that the end is coming for them. She knows that she's going to die, but she's also so worried about her children. She knows even if Louis is killed, that her son may be next, just because he still has some right to the throne. She writes to her sister at one point saying, It is to you, sister, that I write for the last time. I have just been condemned, not on a shameful death. It is to such guilty alone, but to rejoin your brother, innocent like him, I hope to show the same firmness in my last moments. I experience the tranquility of mind ever attending a guiltless conscience. It grieves me very sensibly to leave my poor children. You know that I existed only for them and for you, my kind and affectionate sister. You, you have through affection sacrificed everything in order to be with us. So this is quite a, a moving sort of kind of thing, right? Happy. So like we'll get into kind of, you know, how she's been condemned and stuff, but I just kind of want to set the, the tone of what's going on kind of in this tower and how they all can kind of see um, the beginning of the end coming here. So Louis eventually gets dragged out, charged on a bunch of things and and killed at the guillotine where Marie is now left to live with her, her and her children in this tower. So she writes that letter. Um, she says in the letter as well that, you know, it gives kind of instructions to her sister saying, you know, the, about her kids, like the older one needs to teach the younger one, make sure they stick together because they need to be close. That's so important for them. Um, they should not be separated. And then one thing she kind of ends off with is she says, let my son never forget the last words of his father, which I emphatically repeat to him. Let him never seek to revenge our deaths. So I think that's pretty moving, right? Where it's like, she doesn't care too much about, you know, power. It's just all about how can her children live a good life? How can we make sure that there's no war? And she just doesn't want to see her son embroiled in this like hatred of the French people and the hatred for the old ways of France. Her son does die two years after her death in that same prison, most likely of tuberculosis. So he never gets the opportunity to do so. But I think it speaks volumes to kind of the person that Marie was in terms of just, again, what her number one priority was, was her family and her children. And I don't think power was something that really was at the top of her list. So just to kind of wrap things up with Marie and her life. So the story goes that a soldier dropped a note explaining how she would be saved, kind of tried to drop it to her. It was discovered and basically everybody thought that she was going to be 
the, like the big European powers were going to try to get her out and then help her lead a counter revolution into the country. So she was found guilty of making secret arrangements with Austria and Prussia, which Prussia had just joined the war with Austria against France. She was charged of shipping money abroad to Louis's two younger brothers who were in exile and conspiring within with these enemies against France. She was accused of manipulating the king's foreign foreign policy. So a lot of different things kind of coming up here, not being seen as pro France. And then there was this really nasty charge that came out where that was completely fabricated that she had committed some sort of incest with her son. And then this, they say, was very interesting. She stood up and said, nature refuses to answer such a charge brought up, brought against a mother. I appeal in this matter to all mothers present in the court. And apparently that kind of shut everybody up. Everybody kind of went, yeah, what, what are you guys doing here? You know? Everybody knows that this mm-hmm. this is impossible. Yeah. This cannot happen. I mean, she's known. Apparently, her trial went on for 32 hours over two days. She maintained her comp- her composure, um, was able to kind of answer all the questions against her, you know, very honestly. But again, the trial was a sham for the most part. She is this sure, ultimate yeah. scapegoat. She's a way to bring France together. We uh, we've taken the, you know the head off this traitorous spender who has brought all these terrible things onto France. So eventually, she's condemned to death she writes that letter to her sister which i I read a bit earlier so she's taken out on october 16th 1793 and executed at 12 15 p.m on on the guillotine in front of about a crowd of about twenty thousand people so it ends the life i think of someone who i found was a lot more interesting than i kind of gave credit to you know let them eat cake was all i really knew kind of going into (laughs) this but I saw a great quote about her from a, one of her biographers um, who said, perhaps the most single, this is, per, speaking of Marie, is perhaps the most single example in history of the way in which destiny will at times pluck a mediocre human being from obscurity and with a commanding hand, force this man or woman in, in question to overstep the bounds of mediocrity. And I think that kind of wraps wow. her up in a, in a pretty interesting light because we see she doesn't really have this ability to lead. She doesn't really have this ability to get the people on her side to really see past what's going on. And she, But again, she's brought into this centerfold and becomes so important to this revolution that she's definitely not someone you can say is medi- mediocre in any way. Um, very much at the highs and lows of, of various things. So I think it's kind of an, I would say, is a good way to kind of maybe wrap up kind of her life before we kind of get into a little bit of analysis on she's just very interesting in the fact that it yeah, didn't have these skills, but ultimately knew what her job was. Like if her job was just be a really good mother and things were going well in France, she probably could have done that, but was kind of drawn into this whole fanfare of being the queen and the revolution and lavish spending mm-hmm. and living in Versailles. And it's just taking someone who maybe wasn't, quite right for that environment and at that time um, and sticking them into a very, very unique situation. Yeah, I'd have to agree with uh, a lot of what you just said, Paul. I think when I went into this, I had some ideas of Marie Antoinette that probably were not as accurate or as representative of who she was as a person. I had kind of just seen her as as more of a caricature, really, I think. not very, you know, dynamic, not much to her very surface level. And I think, I think there was, it's kind of two things. One, I think she played a much more important role than I had initially considered. And I think the second thing, you know, on that note would be how she became a symbol for the French populace yeah. um, of this extravagance and luxury in the face of, you know, social and political upheaval. Um, I think those are the two kind of stark takeaways for me that were really, like, I guess, cool, interesting, uh, like historical learnings. Definitely. Yeah. And I think to what you were saying is kind of how it kind of brings all together. And she was bro- seen in front of the French people. And, and there's a great quote that someone wrote here that I really liked. And basically it says, Marie Antoinette would have been perfectly happy to be played only as the ceremonial part as a queen. But Louis's weaknesses forced her to take that more dominant role for which the French people could not forgive her cartoons depicted her as a harpy trampling on the constitution she was blamed for bankrupting yeah. the company with when others in the high spending lavish court bore equal responsibility ultimately she was condemned simply for being louis's wife and a symbol of tyranny i think yeah. wraps it wraps it up quite nicely because louis's weakness forced her into this role this is maybe not something she wanted mm-hmm. nor was she trained for this right she was not trained to be yep you know we looked at what was her job give louis a, a male heir and you know 
raise the kids and be a good good wife like that was really it but again that that cord and the spending and everything kind of you know brought everything to the forefront but i think it still goes back to why we do this podcast of she is ultimately a leader in this case whether she was designed or trained to be or not she ended up being maybe not the one calling the shots but definitely Mm -hmm. the one that people saw and i think that's a big thing when we look at leaders right is there's the level of there's great you know, sometimes I look at it even in the working world, right? You have a great boss, someone who knows how to get things done, but are they a great leader? Do they inspire? Do they make people know the direction that they need to go in? And so I think for Marie, it's that maybe she wasn't the one calling the shots, but she definitely is a leader in the sense of public perception relied on how they saw her. And ultimately, she failed to a certain degree. A lot of things were stacked against her. And I don't think it was easy, but, you know, not being able to, yeah. to see past the, you know, maybe whatever was in eye shot or within the gates of Versailles and really living in that ivory tower sort of setup and not going out and seeing this, the real world. And we see that with leaders all the time. You hear it from Kings and emperors from all the way back to, you know, maybe the ancient Roman times to today of this, you know, the CEO sitting in their penthouse suites, kind of, you know, thinking yep. everything's good yep. when they're, when their workers are really struggling and all of those kind of things. So it really, it's a classic tale, I think from, from the beginning of time and one we still, you know, see today. I think you nailed it, man. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think the two, I think to your initial point, you know, why do we do this podcast? I think what do we, what can we learn from these examples, these narratives, these stories that are relevant today? And I think this example is actually more relevant than ever in our current, you know, environment. And the two things that really will stick with me is the importance of optics <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and leadership. I think optics is everything 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 if you don't focus on the optics then someone else is focusing on the optics and right. now if you're in a position where you're not controlling the optics then people have creative license and freedom to create narratives and stories that can, can put you in a very unfriendly light whether it's deserving or not isn't really the point i don't think that is ever the point of optics <laughs> yeah optics is in the eye of the holder And I think to your last point about like leadership and CEOs, I think it's Simon Sinek, his kind of sentiment that leaders eat last, Hmm. right? In this case, um, the leaders very much ate first (laughs) and then they offered cake afterwards. (laughs) (laughs) And I think that is a really big takeaway for me, even in the world that we currently live in today, when people are struggling, whether it's housing prices, grocery prices, things of that nature, you know, there's obviously things that are very close to home today. And then you compound that with news headlines of CEO and executive packages being bumped 30 to 40 percent in a right. time of like economic crisis. You really start to see a sentiment of, of, of anger marginalization you know people become the focal points of that intensity and i think marie antoinette is an example of what can happen if you aren't aware of those optics and how you're kind of carrying yourself um whether you know it or not whether you're designed to do so or you're trained to do so i don't think is is as important but when you're in a position of such leadership and notoriety I think it's just something you have to be cognizant of because if you're not, it can get away from you very quick. Definitely. I think you hit the nail on the head there of, of kind of how it's, there's a stark similarity from, you know, today to, to back then with small differences, but again, we're all people at the end of the day. And I think these, exactly. these optics are are so, so important. And when, like you said, when you're, if you're a leader and you're eating first, people are going to notice and they're going to notice quickly. And I think too, like I even have written down here, but like the inability to adapt a little bit with just things that were changing in France at the time, but also like Mm -hmm. kind of you mentioned optics. Think of like, you know, the printing press is a new thing. The way media is being portrayed back then, very different, right? And even being able to get ahead of the narrative and using those tools, I don't think they were quite strong at it. And even today, like social media is new and the way we, we get information is new. And it's going to be interesting in the next whatever number of years on how people take that challenge of how do we maintain good optics and kind of fight back against, you know, seeing, being seen in a, in a negative light, you know, whether deservingly or not, which I think was your point earlier of if you're a leader, you got to control the optics mm-hmm. because it can end very badly exactly. if you aren't able to at least maybe not get it to a point where you're favorable, but at least to a point where you're not so negative, like someone like Marie, where all point, all fingers are, are essentially pointed at her. 
So yeah, I think um, I think that's probably a good place to to maybe wrap it up. I think just yeah, kind of closing thoughts are. I think yeah, Marie definitely gets a bad rap for just being that focal point of yes. of yep. you know of bad optics. Um, but ultimately, that was the place she was put in, and I don't think really rose to the to the challenge of of what she needed to do at the time. And I think we talk about every leader we've talked about is not many of them are chosen to lead. Many of them are just thrown into the fire and the ones that come out are the ones that we consider great leaders and the ones that don't, don't come out as great leaders. But again, I think to Marie, there's definitely a more warmth and kind of loving piece to her that I don't think, I think gets missed through all this propaganda. Like we see in the letters to about her kids and, you know, not seeking revenge was such a huge thing for me. It's like, she just, let's just put this to bed. Let's have everybody live a normal life. You know, not really, not really a huge narcissist, like, you know, being the center of the universe, like the sun or anything like that, <laughs> which I think is something to speak to, especially at that time. So I think, yeah, Marie is definitely someone I'm going to look at with a different light. But ultimately, I think you can say failed at what she needed to do. And even though she was dealt, yep. maybe one of the toughest hands she could have been dealt, ultimately didn't rise to the occasion. And I think Louis is just as fault here, probably even to a greater degree. And which kind of ends ends off in the way of of people who who really can't rise to that occasion, unfortunately for them. Yep, couldn't agree with you more, Paul. I think that kind of wraps it up for me personally. I think I have a new appreciation for Marie Antoinette, and I think I have better understanding of the dynamics between the two and how that interplay really, you know, was largely ineffective. And both kind of <laughs> were looking at each other like, you know, hands up. Why don't you do it? Why don't you do it? And they ended up in a scenario where neither of them did much. And it ultimately galvanized into, you know, the overthrowing of the monarchy and, and the French Revolution as we know it today. Definitely. Very well said. So, yeah, we can wrap it up there. And I thank everybody for, for joining us for another episode and uh, hope you all learned something. And we'll uh, see you all next time. See you all next time. Thank you so much for listening to the History in Motion podcast. We appreciate your support. And if you're a fan of what you heard, please like, subscribe, and share. And we'll see you next time.